And how many seconds, Grace, did you allot for our intros? About 10 seconds each, approximately. Okay. Good luck, everyone. Thanks, you too. All right, welcome everyone. Today's tutorial is about using a harms and benefits approach for fairness assessments. The presenter team developed this approach as part of a consulting engagement with the Monetary Authority of Singapore throughout last year. And today we'll share our work and our research paths that stem from the real life cases. First, we'll start with a quick round of introductions. I'm Grace Abu Hamad and I'm a program manager in the trustworthiness group at Element AI, which was recently acquired by ServiceNow as of January, 2021. And I work with Mark, who will now introduce himself. Hi everyone, my name is Marc Hassan Brunet. I'm a research scientist uh, at Element AI and also a graduate student at the University of Toronto and the Vector Institute. Pass on to Lachlan. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Lachlan McCalman. I'm Chief Practitioner at Gradient Institute, which is a non-profit ethical AI research lab based in Australia. And also we've got my colleague, Dan. Hi everyone, I'm Dan Steinberg and I'm a researcher at uh, Gradient. Great, so we've structured our, the next 90 minutes with the Q&A breaks throughout each section. We know it's hard to be interactive in these online settings, but we hope that's a step in the right direction. You can ask questions at any time via Slido, and we'll answer them either via Slido or during the Q&A slot um, out loud. We'll start today by giving some background on the project and the fairness methodology that we developed. Then we'll go through two case studies, one on credit scoring and the other on direct marketing. And finally, We'll end with a discussion on some of the shortcomings in our work and a presentation of the future research uh, in, that we think could, could be useful. All right, so let's get started. A few years ago, Singapore's Monetary Authority, which is the country's financial regulator and central bank, recognized the changing landscape for financial services and AI systems. They formed an industry partnership in 2018 to develop principles for fair, ethical, accountable, and transparent AI, hence the acronym FEAT, FEAT. But we all know that principles aren't implementable on their own. So our job was to develop that implementation for financial services institutions, also known as banks here. To help guide the implementation, the consortium identified two use cases, credit scoring and direct marketing. Now, why is this interesting or important? To our knowledge, this is the first fairness assessment of its kind. It's likely to lead to regulation down the line, though at this time, adopting the methodology is voluntary. But more importantly, we experienced firsthand a tension between theoretical work and practical applications, especially when doing this at the scale of large financial institutions with a variety of use cases in mind. Our goal here 
is to show you those challenges and motivate research in the field to help address them. The Monetary Authority selected a large team for this project, and we benefited from having an all hands on deck approach, especially with regard to different areas of expertise on the team, including fairness and machine learning researchers, data scientists, and financial sector and management specialists. The consortium itself consists about, of about 25 finance, insurance, and tech firms, and they provided feedback throughout the process. We'll note here that while we didn't have in our mandate to consult with affected communities directly, the methodology itself recommends that banks do this as part of defining their fairness objectives. We mentioned earlier that our task was to develop implementation guidance and code based on a principles document and the fairness principles in particular. In terms of outputs, there are two documents that represent over 200 pages combined and a code base on GitHub. So the first document contains the methodology and the technical references. And the second document contains the case studies on customer marketing and credit scoring. All of this work is publicly available. We've got links on the screen here and we've made the presentation as well as the links available via Slido and Circle, et cetera. So we've mentioned these FEAT principles multiple times. The document itself consists of 14 principles divided into four sections, fairness, ethics, accountability, and transparency. Our project focused specifically on the four principles in the fairness section, which are now on the screen. When you look at these principles, the authors seem principally concerned with first justifying any systematic performance on individuals or groups of individuals, including the use of personal attributes. And second, making sure that data models and decisions based on these systems are regularly checked to reduce the risk of unintentional bias. We're at a premier fairness conference, so you all know about fairness. And while our client and the consortium were eager to exchange on fairness issues, most of them came into the project with an expectation that there would be one right definition of fairness or one right measure. This was a gap that we closed in part via copious literature review and also by showing that there could be various interpretations of the FEAT principles themselves, such as, you know, how do you know which groups to consider? Once we were better able to articulate the context dependent nature of fairness, we both motivated and brought more value to our harms and benefits approach. Another reason why it's important not just to solve for fairness is the Singapore context itself. Um, as you can see in here, the four of us co-presenters today are not Singaporean. Nevertheless, we were conscious of our possible biases and wanted to avoid any neo-colonial approaches to our research. So one of the first things we did as part of this project was study the Singaporean legal and regulatory context. And we wanted to share with you our key findings and hypotheses. The first one is that most fairness literature assumes a generally Western legal context. By this, we're primarily referring to the assumption of a predetermined or existing list of protected classes, such as Title VII in the US and the Equality Act in the UK. In Singapore, however, there is no such list. This means that, as we'll describe later, banks have to choose the groups with which to be fair, and those groups could be different for each firm. Importantly, while many firms well, firms don't have predefined groups, this doesn't mean that they aren't liable for discrimination or that they have free reign when it comes to privacy law or personal data. In fact, Singapore has a comprehensive GDPR-like privacy law and a strong privacy regulator. And while the fairness methodology itself does not explicitly address privacy, we were instructed to assume that firms would manage compliance with, with relevant privacy regulation. The second point is that Singapore gained its independence relatively recently in the 1960s, and it's known for its melting pot culture, both by virtue of its geopolitical placement and its history. Our hypothesis is that these elements create an acute sense of identity and may be the reason why Singapore is jumping headfirst into conversations around fairness, ethics, accountability, and transparency. Singapore has also deliberately over time placed itself as a thought leader in technology, and if you look at Stanford's recently released 2021 AI index, uh, 
they show Singapore as the country with the most AI job growth. Finally, whatever your view is on the public policies, such as Singapore's ethnicity-based quotas for public housing, our hypothesis is that these indicate an interest in engaging on fairness through awareness. In fact, when we mentioned earlier that we faced a gap in the fairness mindset or fairness understanding in terms of the one right approach or one right measure, we didn't encounter any resistance to the fairness through awareness mindset. And you'll even see how the methodology incorporates a section, part D, which we'll come to, on justifying personal attributes used, creating the expectation that some such information would very much be a factor. So given the fact that this conference still mostly attracts a Western audience, we thought it was important to highlight and discuss the specific context in which the methodology was developed. By now you've heard us mention the harms and benefits approach multiple times, but you may be wondering what it is and why we chose to focus on it. So our focus came primarily from early interactions with the banks. Banks were looking for a simple answer. They were looking for some type of a Boolean function to determine whether their system was fair or unfair. We knew that our work could end up a regulatory requirement down the road. And we believe strongly that it would be wrong to appease firms simple desire for that binary approach to fairness. Given how our concepts of fairness have evolved over time, they're con context specific, et cetera, the only way to truly define a fairness objective was to go through the exercise of considering a system's positive and negative impacts. This meant more work for the banks in defining their fairness objectives, but it was better for regulators and society more broadly because the approach is adaptive and doesn't codify one fairness measure for perpetuity. As a conclusion of sorts, we'll go through the design goals uh, for the fairness methodology. So we've talked about defining fairness. We didn't wanna dictate how firms defined fairness or picked fairness metrics for them. So we asked firms instead to be explicit about their claims. Broadly, this meant that the assessment would ask them to state and justify their fairness objectives in terms of harms and benefits of the system, then provide evidence to show that the system aligns with those objectives, and finally, give an assessment output to an internal or external assessor. At the same time, we needed our assessment methodology to be generic across use cases, customizable for use case specifics when needed, and finally, scalable to systems with different levels of risk. And in this case, able to be integrated with existing risk management practices in the banks. Now I'll, I'll pass it on to, to Lachlan, who will describe the FEAT fairness methodology in detail, which we just sort of went over the background for. Thanks very much, Grace. So I'll now give a short overview of the methodology itself. Uh, it will be sort of incomplete due to time constraints, but I encourage you to, to go and take a look at the, at the full methodology, which we've linked to in the, in the comments. Uh, next slide, thanks, Grace. So first, let's briefly mention something about the intended users of the methodology. Uh, through the document, we defined three categories of user with different roles in the process. Um, the first one is the IDA system developer. So IDA in this case is AI and data analytics, which is the nomenclature that mass use in, uh, to sort of categorize their AI systems. So the system developer first is the party that actually writes the code. Uh, this is often an internal team in sort of early research type work and prototype deployment, but it may end up being an external vendor once uh, uh, the, the bank has gone and, and placed a system in production. Next, we have the most critical role, which is the system owner. So this is the party on whose behalf the system is making decisions. That is, it's the party that's actually responsible for the system. Uh, in the FEAT context, this will certainly be the bank itself and probably a specific business unit within the bank. In our initial consultation with banks, we sort of noted a default assumption that any fairness methodology that we developed would be something mainly or possibly even exclusively performed by the data scientists. It was something you gave to the data scientists and, 
they gave you back the, the result. Um, we felt it really important to emphasize that asking, for example, data scientists to specify appropriate trade-offs between consequential objectives or acceptable risk levels for the system represented a really radical change in the placement of accountability in the bank and was sort of inconsistent with their existing risk management approaches, especially for traditional statistical models. So in, so in that case, the ADA system owner is really the person who is at the forefront of answering the methodology uh, questions. Finally, we have the, uh, the system assessors. So these are the people that take the output of the assessment that is performed and make a judgment about that system's alignment with the FEAT principles. Depending on the nature of the assessment, this could be an independent auditing team within the bank. It could be an external uh, auditor that the bank has brought in, or potentially it could be a regulator as well. Um, next slide, thanks, Grace. Okay, so onto the assessment itself. Um, the, the, the feet fairness assessment consists of 18 questions divided into five parts. And these are the five parts that you see here. Um, these parts broadly follow the model life cycle and we've sort of divided them such that different uh, parts of the bank may lead different parts of the assessment. Um, for example, some like the initial part describing the system objectives and context might be led by uh, business managers, while the data and models part is likely to be led by the data scientists. So the key idea here is that these 18 questions are designed to elicit the key properties of the system relevant to the alignment with the feet fairness principles, and such that the answers to those questions are enough information by themselves so that an independent assessor can make a judgment about that alignment. We wanted this output to be as complete and self-contained as possible. We also saw the completion of an assessment as part of a continuous journey. Time marches on, uh, reality evolves, uh, and so a regular and continual approach to the assessment is critical. Next slide, thanks, Grace. Okay, so uh, I've put up briefly here the actual 18 assessment questions that form the core of the methodology. Uh, they're in uh, document one, which you can take a look at. Uh, we'll also see some of the issues that are examined by these questions in the two case studies that we're gonna talk about a bit later. So I'm not gonna go through the questions one by one, but I'm now gonna go into a bit more detail just about the intention of each part and the work involved for the bank. So, uh, next slide, thanks, Grace. Okay, so the first part is about describing the system objectives and context. The purpose of this part is really to make explicit the objectives and constraints of the system that's being assessed and to understand its level of risk. So these objectives both relate to fairness as well as the other purposes um, at constraints of the system, including regulatory ones. At this stage, we're looking for qualitative answers, but they, these form a base from which quantitative measures of systematic disadvantage are required in, in later sections. And the goal here is really to allow the assessors to understand in human language the intent behind the system's fairness goals so they can separate it from the implementation the bank has achieved. And um, for example, whether the quantitative measures that the bank has used for fairness actually align with its stated intent. Next slide, thanks, Chris. So in part B, we then dive a little deeper into the models and data uh, used by the system. As we know, data collection, preparation and use, the modeling assumptions that go into building predictive models, the objectives uh, encoded into those models and to the system more broadly can all be sources of, of unwanted systematic disadvantage. Um, in some cases as well, uh, this, these types of biases are not revealed by standard fairness measures. So for example, like biases in lab targets or labels. 
So then it's particularly important to allow assessors to examine these parts of the systems for any uh, assumptions that they believe may be uh, causing bias that we can't detect you know, with standard measures. So um, this really, the goal here is to provide the assessors with a, an understanding of the system's internal mechanisms. Uh, next slide, thanks, Grace. Okay, so then we get to kind of the core of the methodology, which is where banks must determine measures of their disadvantage and uh, the, the system causes and justify that disadvantage. So here we're asking banks to quantify their fairness objectives and constraints, uh, show how these are traded off with the system's other objectives and constraints, and then explain their justification for preferring their chosen operating point over the alternatives that are available to them. Uh, so the result of this analysis uh, by sort of defining the harms and benefits in a specific measure, looking at disparities of those and then computing trade-offs may result in an existing fairness measure being used um, like precision parity, or it might be something novel and specific to the application depending on the circumstances under which those harms uh, occur. And you'll see examples of both of these in the upcoming case studies. Next slide, thanks Chris. In part D, we approach the part of the feet fairness principles that asks banks to justify the use of personal attributes. Now, in addition to the, a lack of um, specific regulation on protected classes, uh, as Grace mentioned, there's also no uh, universal rule about the notion of personal attributes as used in the feet principles. So again, we have to ask the banks to state their choices and justify them uh, to allow those choices to be critiqued by the assessors. The, uh, the inclusion or exclusion of a personal attribute, as we know, is a trade-off decision. Again, when we started, there was a general sense with the banks of just sort of, great, let's never use personal attributes, that, that one's solved. Um, as we know, of course, Fairness through unawareness is an ineffective strategy in general at, at uh, minimizing systematic disadvantage. So in this section, the banks are faced with a trade-off often between a fairness objective on one hand and a privacy concern on the other. So we ask the banks to justify their operating point in that trade-off. Next slide, thanks. And finally, we get to part E, which is the examination of the system monitoring and review. AI systems that perform well today may not do so tomorrow. Unintended consequences of a system's operation are inevitable. And of course, models trained on historical data will gradually lose touch with reality as it evolves. So the FEAT principles recognize this and explicitly require banks to monitor and review the performance of their AI systems with respect to fairness. So in the methodology, we examine this in three ways. We look at how unacceptable performance and unintended consequences are detected and monitored. We ask a broader question about how the banks ensure that the system's specific design and intent actually continues to align with what they want out of the system. And finally, we examine when things do go wrong, as they invariably will at some point, what mechanisms the bank has put in place to mitigate any harms that might occur. Okay, so um, you may be thinking, next slide, thanks, Grace. You may be thinking that these asks are pretty challenging. They are. Uh, even for an organization with lots of AI experience uh, and even one that's been thinking about fairness for a long time. So to help firms as much as possible, we included an extensive set of considerations to take them through the answering of the questions and provide sort of uh, ways to help them come up with answers and relevant reference references in the literature. Uh, these were done both for the sort of generic um, methodology that applies across use cases and also a fair bit of specific uh, consideration for the two case studies in credit scoring and direct marketing. Uh, finally, of course, we acknowledge that this assessment assumes that an organization has fairness objectives for their system. Um, which they've already integrated. Uh, 
And of course, for many banks, especially ones in the early part of this journey, this is not the case. Uh, in, in that case, the methodology is sort of designed to serve as more of a guidebook, uh, particularly with these considerations to help them actually develop those aspects of their system uh, and then perform a test uh, as validation. All right. Um, so after, okay, so I'm going to hand back to Grace now for our first set of uh, question and answers. Thanks, Lucky. And Dan and Mark, do we have any questions? We do. We do have some questions here. Um, and so I'll read out uh, actually two questions uh, in the Q&A. So the first one um, is, are there actual studies showing that fairness under awareness is acceptable to Singaporeans? as opposed to just something that the government imposes. Singaporeans had no say in the setting up of racial housing quotas. It was something imposed from above. Yeah, that's a very good point. I'm not aware of any studies on uh, Singaporean perspectives on the on fairness through awareness. So that's a, a good point. Um, it's true that they, Singapore has had a very directive um, approach to their to governing and public policy. And uh, we don't, I'm not aware of any studies at this point. Great. The next question we have is, um, in the US, zip code significantly correlates to race. In Singapore, are there similar characteristics, i.e. where even if race were excluded as an implicit attribute, it can will be inferred um, by or from other attributes, um, and I can I can answer that. Um, so I, I think the, the the short answer to this is that um, we we do in fact consider these types of correlations in in this methodology, and um, as we go through the case studies, uh, I think uh, that will be clarified. Um, specifically, when looking at um, the justification for the use of personal att attributes, we do, uh, you know, take the time to uh, do sort of a correlation analysis and uh, verify the extent to which other attributes may be just proxies for these, um, uh, you know, personal attributes uh, that need to be justified. Uh, we have a few more questions coming in here. Okay. So the next question, um, could you talk more about the process? How long would the ADA assessment take? During which part of the ADA life cycle do you in, uh, intend for the assessment to happen? How is it going I'll, to be integrated within it. other teams' works? I'll, I'll take this one, Mark. Yeah. Uh, it's a really good question. Uh, and there's no one answer. I mean, one of the things we haven't really don't ha didn't have time to go into a lot of detail about is is the notion of scaling the assessment to the level of risk associated with the system. So, in terms of like how long the assessment will take, uh, we describe a process whereby the banks have to develop internally a way to triage systems based on certain uh, risk factors. Uh, a highly consequential system ought to take a long time and involve deep investigation into every aspect of that system, something that's very far from being able to directly influence uh, the outcomes for customers would get a, a much lower uh, or much shorter amount of time dedicated to it. And this is simply by necessity, because as I'm sure you're aware, there'd be thousands of systems within a large bank that would qualify under this sort of umbrella of, of AI or AI and data analytics. In terms of the, the life cycle, um, we certainly recommend that this process occurs sort of throughout the design and validation and certainly before the system is deployed, but also, as we mentioned, like periodically, uh, of, and we anticipate the assessment really being a continual process. So either regularly or continually, these things should be uh, considered by, by the banks. This sort of depends on factors like how 
stationary the underlying process is that they're trying to model. Um, finally, in terms of integrating with other teams' work, uh, this was a big issue for the banks that we spoke to them a lot about was how to integrate a, a sort of new requirement with their existing regulatory and other ethical requirements and their governance procedures. So in one thing that was interesting was that the different banks we spoke to had quite different views about how they would like to do that. Um, so we kind of provided some guidance in the methodology, but left it a little bit flexible. Um, for example, some banks felt that the existing um, sort of model risk management functions and the, and, and the three lines of defense uh, approach that they've set up, that this could just slot into those existing functions. Whereas other banks wanted to set up their own dedicated governance units for AI ethics, which would exist kind of separately from those uh, systems. So I hope that answers that question. Thanks, Lachlan. There's a, a number of other questions coming in in the chat here, but in the interest of time, I think we'll continue on with the next section of the tutorial. Uh, and in the meantime, we'll answer some of those questions uh, in the chat. And um, if we're unable to answer them, we'll, we'll get to them at the next Q&A break. Great, so I'll stop sharing here and we'll share a video of the credit scoring case study. I'm Marcus Brunet, and I'm now gonna take you through some of the work we did as part of a case study where we applied the feed fairness methodology to a credit approval system. For this case study, we worked with the United Overseas Bank, UOB. I do wanna emphasize that none of the data presented here is UOB data. However, by working closely with the bank, we were able to validate that the assessment methodology we proposed was compatible with the bank's internal systems and processes, and we were able to get immediate feedback on our approach. For the sake of time, I'll only focus on certain parts of the methodology uh, and I'll have to skim through or completely omit others. For a, me, uh, for a more complete picture, uh, please you know, read through section three in Veritas document two. So I'm gonna start with some background about credit approval systems uh, and also go through a light probability refresher. So this will cover some of the work that goes into part A of the methodology, where we really ask that the AI system objectives and the context in which it operates be described. The broad objective of credit approval system uh, is to provide loans in a way that is advantageous for both the customer and for the bank. A good loan is one that gets repaid. It generates revenue for the bank. A bad loan is one ending in default. It incurs costs for the bank. Typically the cost for a bad loan is much, much higher than the revenue from a good loan. This needs to be considered when pricing the loan. And without some kind of lift from a predictive model, uh, pricing would, be, would need to be set using the expected base default rate. So to be more competitive, uh, profitable, and to manage risks, banks will use credit scoring models um, to estimate the, uh, an applicant's credit worthiness or their, their risk of default. And this allows them to filter applicants based on their predicted risk threshold um, uh, or credit score. So our case study in specific focused on models uh, that looked at sort of thin file applicants, which means applicants that have a very little or no lending history and are typically a little bit more difficult to predict. Um, so now I want to quickly review confusion matrices and conditional probabilities because they're quite central to uh, fairness analysis. So suppose you're trying to train a model to predict whether a loan will resolve uh, or end in default. This is really a binary classifier. And here, uh, notationally, we'll let Y be the target variable or outcome uh, that we're trying to predict. And we'll let Y hat be the model prediction. The possible outcomes are default, which we encode as Y equals zero, and resolve, which we encode as Y equal one. So suppose you test your model on a data set of 200 loans 
you can then analyze the outcomes via a confusion matrix. This table uh, organizes your prediction into four buckets. The rows sort the loans by target variable, uh, while the columns will sort the loans by the model predictions. So by sorting the data in this way, along the diagonal, you have the predictions that the model got right, the true positives and the true negatives. While on the off diagonals, uh, you have the errors, which are the, the, the false positives, uh, where the model predicted the loan would resolve, but it actually resulted in default, and the false negatives, where the model predicted the loan would default, but it actually would have resolved. You could read off empirical probabilities from the confusion matrix by looking at the ratio between cells. For example, to compute that the probability that a loan will resolve, um, you would simply add the quantities in the top row and divide by the total number of loans. In this case, you would get 0 0.7. This is known as the base rate, since it is an estimate of the fraction of loans that would resolve if every applicant were given a loan. You can also read off conditional probabilities. This amounts to limiting the calculation to a single row or column uh, in the confusion matrix. For example, we can get the probability of a loan resolving given the model predicts it will resolve. This rate is also known as the model's precision. In this case, it is roughly 0 0.89. So with those basics covered, let's talk about the system's impacts, specifically the allocation of harms and benefits. Let's start by considering subgroups in the data set. Group fairness concerns arise when the system outcomes differ between groups in the data set. I'll illustrate with an example using binary gender. So suppose now that your 200 loans under analysis were for 130 women and for 70 men. So you'll have almost twice as many women as men in your data set. And suppose we break down each cell in the confusion matrix based on this demographic information. You will almost certainly find that the 130 to 70 ratio isn't the same in every cell. As a result, the probabilities and conditional probabilities will be different for these two subgroups. For example, here we find that the base rates are different for men and for women. In this strictly illustrative te uh, test data set, um, men are slightly more likely to repay their loans than women. When we limit ourselves to that first column and look at model precision, we also find a difference. The probability of a loan resolving given that the model predicts resolve is 0 0.8 for men, but 0.94 for women. Therefore, when the system predict, predicts resolve, it is actually more likely to be right um, if that loan was being made for, uh, for a woman. Um, so, you know, we're starting to get a sense of how system outcomes can differ between subgroups. In putting together this methodology, we really wanted to emphasize that it is not enough to you know, blindly try to balance probabilities between subgroups. Uh, a, a meaningful fairness study must be grounded in an analysis of the system's impacts. How do the outcomes actually affect people's lives? And when outcomes do differ between groups, we must determine the relative harms and benefits. Now, determining what harms and benefits to consider and how their magnitudes compare is not simple, uh, nor do we believe that there are any universally right answers. So for, for this case study, we compare the system outcomes to a baseline where the credit product does not exist. Um, we assume that the different outcomes each carry the same harm and or benefit regardless of the applicant receiving that outcome. Now these are assumptions and we do not claim that these are necessarily the best assumptions that the bank can make. But we do believe that you know, this part of the analysis uh, is very important and we strongly recommend uh, the involvement of the bank's internal ethics functions. So from this perspective, the system has a different impact on applicants falling into each quadrant of the confusion matrix. For true positives, there is a benefit. Uh, the applicant has access to credit. For false negative, there's just sort of a lack of benefit. Uh, sorry, for false, yeah, for false negatives, there's a lack of benefit. For false positives, um, there is sort of both a benefit in the sense that the applicant does have access to credit, but there's also a harm um, 
because the applicant will experience the social and financial consequences of default. But finally, uh, the true negative sort of has both a, a lack of benefit and a lack of harm. And so we see that the different outcomes result in different harms and benefits. And we also see that some of these outcomes, like the, the false positive, are complex and, and may require some nuanced thinking. But it, importantly, it's really only once we think through these harms and benefits that, any, that it makes any sense to start measuring discrepancies in the system's outcomes. Because before that, you don't know what to measure. In part B of the methodology, we examine the specific data and models that are used in the AI system. This is important, but we unfortunately don't have time to go into that in very much detail uh, in this tutorial. Uh, all I'm going to say is that, you know, credit scoring is highly regulated uh, and model development involves a lot of documentation. Typically, uh, credit scoring models are, are linear models operating on sort of 10 to 20 input features. Um, and those features are a mix of categorical and numerical variables. Some of these are collected directly from the applicant, and some of these may be sourced from another institution like a credit bureau upon application. And that the model itself will uh, typically output a risk score, which is then thresholded uh, and joined with some other eligibility criteria to make the sort of the final lending decision. So now we've talked about why we use credit scoring models. Um, we discussed the system's impacts and we touched briefly on the types of models and data used in the system. So now we move in, into section C, um, which is measuring disadvantage. I'll start with some common machine learning fairness metrics uh, that have been proposed previously in the literature and then discuss how we chose among them. At a high level, um, most of the group fairness metrics fall into one of three buckets, independence, separation, and sufficiency. Continuing with our example from before, um, independence sort of requires that the probability of a woman being approved for a loan be the same as the probability for a man. This is probably the most common way to think about fairness. It's also known as demographic parity. But there are a few problems with independence. One, it doesn't account for differences in base rates. So maybe the reality of the socioeconomic context is that one group is very much more likely to default than another. Independence would consider it unfair to lend accordingly. Two, it puts true positives and false positives into the same bucket. It only asks that, you know, uh, men and women be approved with equal probability. It says nothing about the errors the model is allowed to make when approving the individuals in those groups. Separation tries to address this by focusing on conditional probabilities. Separation requires that conditioned on the target variable, the probability of a woman being approved is the same as the probability for a man. A few established metrics fall into the, the separation bucket. For example, equal opportunity and equalized odds. I'll go uh, into this in a bit more detail in subsequent slides. Uh, our third bucket, sufficiency, also looks at conditional probabilities. But instead of looking at sort of the rows of the confusion matrix, it looks at the columns. For the sake of time and not to overload you, I, I won't go into any detail about sufficiency today. So let's look at independence a little more closely. Recall independence requires that the probability of a woman being approved is the same as the probability for a man. In our confusion matrix, the probability of approval can be found by dividing the sum of the first column um, by the total number of loans. So this probability works out to be you know, 0.71 um, for a man while roughly 0.75, uh, 0.65 for women. So men are more likely to be given a loan uh, and we do not have uh, independence. Now we can dig a little deeper into separation. Separation really looks at two equalities. The first is known as equal opportunity. It is concerned with the loans that would resolve and, and seeks to balance the true positive rates. So in our confusion matrix, this amounts to limiting our analysis to the top row um, and then you know, calculating the probability that an applicant is approved given that the loan would resolve. So for men, this is 0.8, while for women, it is roughly 0.89. So women who would repay their loans are more likely to be given a loan and we do not have equal opportunity. In fact, on this metric, the system seems to favor women. 
The other part of separation is concerned with uh, what happens to the loans that default. This is the second row in the confusion matrix. Uh, the false positive rebalance is, is really exactly that. It's looking for a balance in the false positive rates. Uh, and this is the probability that a loan is approved given that that loan would default or would result in default. Um, we find that for men, this is a 0 0.5 in this example, while for women it is uh, you know, 0 0.125. So men who would default on the loans are much more likely to be given a loan uh, and we do not have false positive rate balance. So I, don't worry if you didn't follow the details of, of those exact calculations. Um, what's important here is that we just looked at three different metrics and they all told different stories. So demographic parity suggests that the system lightly favors men. Equal opportunity suggests uh, that it lightly favors, favors women while the false positive rate balance suggests that the system heavily favors men. Um, and now I, I put uh, you know, favors in quotations there because recall in a credit scoring use case, uh, a false positive may be interpreted as both a benefit and as a harm. So it's sort of, it can be unclear uh, where, where the what category it falls into. So if these different metrics tell different stories, how do we know which to choose? Um, I mean, I guess very importantly, it's, it's impossible to satisfy all of these fairness criteria simultaneously if the base rates are different between groups. So in basically all but the most trivial cases. Additionally, none of these metrics are universally better uh, than, than the others. You know, how fairness should be measured depends on the harms and benefits of the particular system under consideration. Finally, it, it may even be more appropriate to design a customized way of measuring disadvantage. And we show this approach uh, in sort of in the second case study uh, coming up later in the tutorial. To make things more complicated, um, in production, the target variable is missing uh, for rejected applicants, right? So we know what happens, uh, or we eventually uh, learn what happens um, for the applications that we approve, but we'll, we'll never find out uh, whether the applications we reject would have uh, led to uh, a default or would have resolved. And while it is standard practice in the industry to use reject inference techniques to uh, impute these missing target variables uh, in many credit scoring uh, models, this nonetheless introduces additional uncertainty and, and likely additional bias, and, and that can be very hard to quantify. So this needs to be carefully considered when you're choosing between fairness metrics. So one of the measurement approaches that we proposed for credit scoring uh, in, in the case study is as follows. We argue that applicants that would resolve their loans, um, you know, uh, have, have the most to possibly gain. And you know, equal opportunity uh, is, is concerned with exactly these individuals. And they ensure that an equal proportion of these individuals are being approved in each group. However, the harms from defaults are still ignored. Um, and so what we propose uh, is also monitoring the false positive rate balance. You know, we propose looking at these two metrics separately rather than combining them uh, using something like average odds um, because the harms and benefits are not necessarily directly comparable in this case. Of course, these metrics uh, are both heavily dependent on a reject inference uh, and we recognize that the main, this may not be appropriate for many credit scoring systems. So we propose an alternate approach uh, independent of reject inference in the full case study. Finally, I want to spend some time on performance versus fairness trade-offs. We emphasize that these kinds of trade-offs uh, are, are very important to consider um, because the system's business objectives may not align with the fairness objectives, right? And, and so once you've settled on the groups you're concerned about and how you should measure discrepancy in the allocations of harms and benefits, you may find yourself in situations where you have to make explicit trade-offs. The first trade-off I want to talk about is setting the lending threshold. Because up to this point, we've been talking about 
you know, binary model predictions. But typically, um, the model will output some risk score, the credit score, and applicants below a certain score are denied, while applicants above that score are approved. Setting this threshold is an important operating decision and is usually given a good amount of thought. Um, so here uh, is, is a plot on the right where the axes are lending risk thresholds or credit scores uh, separated for men on the x-axis and for women on the y-axis. The heat map depicts model performance uh, based on the choice of these thresholds. Um, and, and this model performance you can think of as being very closely related with the system's gross, gross profit rate. And it is maximized in the bright yellow region. Um, the white contour lines that have been superimposed indicate the equal opportunity metric applied to binary gender fairness. Um, it, disadvantage is neutralized along that zero contour line. And so ideally we'd be sitting on that zero contour line. Um, there are really three points of interest that I, I wanna highlight here. Uh, the first is the red X, which shows the sort of point of maximum performance subject to using the same lending risk threshold for both men and for, uh, for women. This is likely where most credit scoring models would you know, aim to be operated if there has been no explicit fairness considerations. The blue diamond uh, shows the maximum performance we can get from the model if we are allowed to use different uh, risk thresholds for men and for women. Finally, the purple star indicates max performance subject to uh, neutral equal opportunity. So sitting on that uh, zero contour line. Now the difference in the model performance between the red X and the purple star is possibly a, a sizable chunk of money. And so if a bank were to choose to operate uh, their, their credit scoring model at the purple star, or even just closer to the purple star, that would represent uh, an investment on their part in achieving their fairness goals. Another trade-off I want to touch on is related to the use of personal attributes in the model. In the Singaporean context, um, the second fairness principle uh, basically requires that the use of personal attributes as input factors for AI and data analytics driven decisions be justified. We approach that by saying, look, a, a good way to figure out whether the inclusion of an attribute can be justified is to see what happens when you leave it out. So the bar chart on the right is a leave one out analysis. It goes through the personal attributes in the data, removes them from the set of input features to the model, retrains the model and sees what happens. In blue, you see the effect of, uh, of this removal on model performance. And in orange, you see the impact on the equal opportunity fairness metric, again, as applied to gender. So I won't go through all of this here, um, but if we just look at, for example, attributes like age and education uh, type, we see that, that their removal has a negative impact on model performance uh, and a positive impact on our fairness metric. So choosing whether or not to include them is again, uh, a trade-off. The final step in the methodology is uh, the system monitoring and review process, is, or is looking at the system monitoring and review process. I, again, I don't have time to go into this uh, in, in detail here, but I do want to say that you know, measures of group fairness do tend to be quite sensitive to data drift like covariate shift. Um, and that while it's one thing to, to measure model behavior on some historic validation set, it, it, it can be, a, uh, you know, there can be a bunch of uh, new challenges to measure and monitor them in production. Specifically in credit approval, we typically don't have access to loan outcomes until many months or, or even years later, uh, because we don't know uh, whether the loan will resolve or, or um, end in default until a later period. Um, so there, there are a, a number of challenges here. Uh, that concludes the credit scoring case study uh, and it takes us into the second Q&A. So thank you very much for your time. Cool, all right, so we have a few questions that popped up, although I see that some of them already got replies. So maybe what I'll do is I'll prioritize the questions that um, don't have replies. 
and then maybe slightly more general, I think one of them was, uh, was, was asked a bit before this, but I think it's still relevant. So Carolyn asked, given this flexible approach, it seems plausible that many companies could come up with different judgments, which the system um, assessor will, uh, uh, will uh, presumably have to accept or not. Do they have um, any um, additional guidelines in deciding what to accept? Over time, do you expect the tightening of rules or judgments? I'll take this one. Uh, really great question. <laughs> so we tried to write the considerations around uh, the questions as much for the assessors uh, as they were for the banks. So as much for the people making the assessment as for the people answering the questions. The key idea here is that we didn't want to provide a decision rule for acceptable or unacceptable because ultimately we felt this was an ethical question, not a technical one where we could say, you know, if it's 0.8, then it's okay. What we wanted to do was highlight all the things that the assessor would want to think about when making this judgment. Um, so just provide them with as much information as possible that's relevant to that question. Um, again, you know, depending on whether it's the regulator or an internal function, that's going to be heavily dependent on their own uh, priorities and risk appetite. So um, our, our main goal was to shine light on the considerations uh, that go into that question. In terms of how it evolves over time, we definitely saw this as an as a we saw that many banks are in an early stage with their thinking on fairness, so we would expect it to uh, evolve over time. At, at least we certainly hope so. Cool. Um, I think. Well, Sorry. I'll just add a quick, yeah, maybe just a quick point on on the regulatory side. I mean, we mentioned earlier that this this is guidance at this point, and then the regulator is likely to come down with formal regulation at some point. So those rules might be formalized or standardized once that that regulatory guidance come comes in. But at this point in time, it's it's flexible in part for that reason because it's not regu regulation yet. Cool. Do we have time for one more? Or I understand that we're really... Dan, I think time. we're going to answer all the questions that are started. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. We might take then a shorter break. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So then another one that popped up was, do you have any um, advice on how people in industry fight against leadership trying to automate such ADA um, assessments? It's a bit of a tricky one. It. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And... Uh, I'm glad you asked because we spent a year on this uh, subject, right? The, the advice that I would give is, as you say, it, it's very tempting for an organization to say, okay, here's demographic parity, data scientists go off and, and tick that box, right? And, and we'll just make sure that we apply some mitigation done, uh, the thing that we tried to argue for uh, is the idea of who's actually making the, the accountable decision about this question. So we first tried to show that the, the choices implicit or explicit in the choice of fairness measure makes a really different claims about what is important to the system, like that they can be quite fundamental that some of these mitigations have significant costs associated with the other objectives of the system. And that these kind of decisions, if they were made about any other system in the bank, would have to go through a series of really explicit approval processes that have to be documented, that have, that have to be risk assessments done. But that like at that, but somehow the AI is like the data scientists can worry about that and it's all automated. This was our main argument that it's that these questions are consequential enough that they they make um, they, they make claims that you really want to understand what those claims are and be able to justify them because the, the results can be consequential and that the organizations typically have existing structures to do that exact job, just not, they haven't typically put them into work for, for their AIs. So I hope that answers or helps a little. <laughs>
but it is, it, yeah, it's a really difficult problem. Okay, another one popped up. Did you make any recommendations on the types of skills and educational background the system assessors need to have and how FSIs can develop them internally? Um, so we have a we have some sections on on this we have a little bit but this was a difficult uh challenge for us um because we are obviously asking a lot from um from the banks here i mean one of the key things that we tried to explain in terms of the skills was that it is not sufficient to just get a data scientist here that that the questions around what's the impact of the system on uh, on the people that it's interacting with, that's not a data science question and you need expertise that's able to actually go out and answer that question. That may not be staff in the bank, but, uh, but that it, it's, it's not sufficient to just have the, the data science expertise. So that was the kind of, um, that was the, our main message uh, in, in regard to that question. Do you have anything to add, Grace? No, go ahead. There is another question here. Um, do we have time or should we push on given we're a bit? Yeah, we'd better push on, I think. I think we, okay, yeah. We'll try and think... answer your question in the Slido. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to, we're a little bit behind schedule. We're trying to get a sense of how much we can possibly run over. But I think it might be good for us to go to break now and say, we'll reconvene instead of in 10 minutes, in five, and we'll, we'll start the direct marketing case study then in five minutes from now. Five minute break. Thanks everyone. See you in five minutes. <laughs>
Hi everyone, Lachlan here. So now I'm going to go through the second case study. This case study uses the uh, feet fairness assessment we've presented already uh, to assess an AI system for marketing financial products. So the system's hypothetical, but its design was informed by real systems that were running in the collaborating banks that we worked with during the project. So the reason we chose to do a hypothetical or synthetic example here is because the real marketing systems contain both sensitive customer data that uh, we couldn't disclose and didn't want to, and also a fair bit of proprietary information about the bank's systems. Uh, the assessment's quite detailed and, and there's some issues around disclosure there. It also allowed us to control and make as interesting and illustrative the case study as possible. So the code for generating all the data and for conducting the analysis is available on GitHub and uh, we'll provide the link again um, before the end of the tutorial. The system we're going to look at today is an AI system for doing what's called direct marketing. So this is where we market directly to a person uh, with say a phone call or an email. This is compared to like putting up a billboard or a poster which is less discriminate. Direct marketing is also sometimes called targeted marketing because we're using the AI to try and find the right people to target with our marketing intervention. The approach that this AI system takes to targeting is based on what's called uplift or true lift modeling. So this is where we try to target people who will buy the product if and only if they receive the marketing intervention. This is uh, commonly used when we have uh, an intervention that itself costs money, like um, a discount code or a one-on-one -on -one call where we have to pay the person making the call. By targeting people with uh, based on uplift, uh, we're not wasting interventions on people that would buy the product anyway, or people that will never buy the product no matter what we do. Uplift itself is the increase in customer response probability when they're treated compared to when they're not. If I have a 10% likelihood of buying the product when I don't receive the intervention and a 15% uh, likelihood of buying the product when I do receive the intervention, then my uplift is 5%. So typically we're trying to maximize this quantity or select people who have a lot of this quantity um, or sometimes related quantities like the profit, uh, which also encapsulates the cost of the marketing intervention itself. So to compute this lift, we actually do need some causal information about the system and particularly about the strength of the intervention. The simple way to obtain this is to run a randomized control trial. So many uplift systems run RCTs before they're deployed and some of the more sophisticated ones uh, use things like contextual bandits to combine the experimentation and deployment into a single stage. There are lots of ways to think about analyzing this kind of system under the methodology, uh, particularly how we think about the harms and benefits of the system. So we based our approach for the case study on the following idea. And this is that if a marketing system causes someone to buy a product, then it shares some responsibility for the harms and benefits of that product. Take, and for example, a marketing system that is very effective at convincing customers in certain demographic to take on loans they can't afford. And those people default at a much higher rate than walk-in customers who have the, taking on the same product. So this idea argues that a share of the responsibility for the harms caused by those defaults is shouldered by the marketing system. And therefore, in this kind of analysis, that we should examine those harms in an assessment of the marketing system. This was a rich source of discussion with the banking practitioners in the consortium. Some agreed wholeheartedly with this premise, uh, while others argued more that the failing that I described there would have been in the loan acceptance process rather than the marketing system. Analyzing one doesn't stop you from analyzing the other, so in this case we decided to proceed. Now conveniently, the uplift approach allows us to analyze the system's share of those harms and benefits created by the product it sells because we can estimate the causal effect that it had in, in getting people to buy the product and therefore to receiving those harms and benefits. 
So let's dive into the, uh, the five parts of the assessment itself for this system. Similar to the first case study, we're not gonna have time to go through question by question. And what I'm gonna try and do is just give you a highlight reel and refer to the document for the, for the really meaty stuff. So part A starts with the system objectives and context. So this would typically be completed by the product owner or senior manager responsible for the system uh, and usually within the bank. The product being marketed by our system is, is what's called a fast and simple loan. So it's an unsecured personal loan um, that people can take on. It's possible to obtain this loan just by walking into a branch, um, but we're also helping customers apply with our marketing intervention. So the intervention here that is that a customer is called by someone in a call center and they are told about the product and, um, and offered help with the application process over the phone. So the goal of the system therefore is to increase the profit from this loan, get more people to take it up compared to the baseline of just the walk-in only uh, customers. And critically, we're going to assume here that the customers that are being targeted for the intervention have not necessarily been pre-approved for the loan. So they may subsequently be declined when they apply for the loan. And this will be relevant for the harms and the benefits later. So next in part A, we're asked to identify the key harms and benefits associated with the system. So I want to emphasize that this again is a simplified example. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list of harms and benefits of this type of system. Uh, it's illustrative and kept as simple as possible for the, for the case study. Also worth noting that this was another main topic of rich discussion with the banks. Uh, there was certainly no universal agreement within the consortium on relevant or significant harms and benefits, even in this simple situation. And that just sort of underlies the, the difficulty associated with coming up with the, the one true fairness measure for, for everyone in all contexts. So let's go through the harms and benefits that we elected to um, put in this assessment. So we note first a benefit for acquiring the loan because of the marketing system. So presumably the called customer, if they would not otherwise have acquired the loan, then the marketing system helped them acquire the loan. They wanted it presumably because they applied for it and received it, so they've accrued a benefit. Uh, there's a, a harm associated with applying for a loan because the marketing system convinced you to, but then being rejected. In some cases, a rejected application for a loan can go on uh, a record and can make it more difficult in the future to obtain credit if you have a, a lot of rejected loan applications in your, in your history. So this we associate with a, with a harm. We also note a benefit just from receiving the intervention ir irrespective of whether you actually go on to get the product. And this is the idea behind this is simply that uh, customers who uh, don't have to wait in a long phone queue to speak with a someone who knows about the credit products can has an opportunity to ask questions that they wouldn't otherwise get um, now we note the small magnitude of this benefit and sort of uh, monitor it rather than incorporate it into the fairness measures then uh, finally a harm associated with customers defaulting on a loan that they acquired because of the marketing system we're not going to analyze this for the sake of brevity, but it is something that we wanted to call out. Next, part A of the assessment asks us to identify the key individuals and groups at risk of, of these harms and, uh, harms and benefits. So for simplicity in this case study, we defined only a single binary category to analyze, uh, which was the nationality of customers and this was either they were a Singapore national or a foreign national. Now I want to emphasize that this is just for illustrative purposes. In a real system, the methodology strongly recommends analyzing a much wider set of groups, especially those for whom there exists evidence of historical or on ongoing disadvantage and drawing from uh, groups found in anti-discrimination law would be a very good start there. Finally, part A of the methodology asks system owners to specify their fairness objectives and constraints qualitatively at first. 
uh, we developed two for the case study. Uh, so the first is to ensure that the rejection harm rate is not substantially increased as a result of the marketing system. Second uh, is that we want to ensure that the rejection harm rate rates are not increased more for foreign nationals compared to locals. And the reasoning behind these is that uh, foreign nationals in our hypothetical example have higher historical rejection rates um, and therefore we should be extra careful not to amplify this disparity. Uh, this harm has the possibility of making it more difficult to obtain credit in the future. So uh, this could create a feedback loop that we want to avoid. Okay, so now we move on to part B. Part B of the methodology asks us to examine the data and models used by the system. And this is to help assessors spot potential issues that don't show up in standard fairness measures like label bias, for instance, and also to gain some clues about the sources of any systematic disadvantage that the system may uh, demonstrate. When we're building this system, the first step is to establish the effectiveness of the intervention. Um, we do this through a randomized controlled trial, and we want to learn, for example, how well the intervention works on different people within the cohort. So uh, women compared to men, people of a certain income. In other words, we want to condition that effectiveness on the, on the feature vector that we have about each person. And we do this in the simple way just by having a customer base that we divide in two randomly, ensuring that we've got the, the, those features are represented similarly in the two groups. And then we treat one and we leave the other alone and uh, we're able to then compare a treatment and a control. Um, each of those has three possible outcomes that we then measure. Uh, no, no response, like didn't buy the, didn't buy the loan, applied and acquired the loan or applied and was declined. So with this data in hand, we can now build two models. A model that aims to predict the product lift uh, given a person is treated and untreated, and also uh, one that aims to predict the rejection rate lift. Uh, so this is the probability of a person being rejected given they apply and are either treated or not treated. So with these two models, we can compute estimates of the harms and benefits that we've defined. So once we've done the RCT and we've got those models, we need to decide who to send the interventions to now we're in production. The way our system does this is by selecting a threshold for product lift and intervening on everyone whose lift is above that threshold. So these are the people who are most likely to be persuadable in the sense that uh, our intervention has made the difference in terms of whether they bought the product. Now, in terms of selecting the threshold, we can see that it will affect both the predicted profit we make from the system, but also the predicted rejection rate harm. The rough intuition here is a high threshold sends the intervention to no one, a low threshold sends it to everyone. Sending it to no one misses opportunities, so we don't see much profit, whereas sending it to everyone wastes money on interventions that don't work because we're sending them to low uplift individuals, so we also see low profit. In terms of the rejection rate increase, generally this will go up the more people we select because more people are getting loans due to our interventions and then there's a certain rate at which those people are getting rejected and so we're getting more rejections. In production then, we will have an eligible customer base on which we deploy the system. We've selected our lift threshold. We estimate the lift values of the customers using the models from our RCT and then if they're above that threshold, we give them a call we apply the intervention. It's worth pointing out here that even once deployed, the actual lift and rejection lift numbers will both be estimates. Even once we know whether they buy the product or not, we still don't directly observe the counterfactual. We, we don't know whether they would have bought it uh, had we not given them the intervention. And so we still have to presume that our models developed as part of the RCT are correct uh, and this to create these estimates. And this is a substantial source of uncertainty for the fairness questions that we're asking as part of the assessment.
All right, now we get to part C, which is the crux of the methodology where we try to measure quantitatively how we're achieving our fairness objectives. We're going to develop specific fairness measures that flow from the previous parts, from the harms and benefits and from the groups that we're worried about. Uh, and we're basing these on this lift idea, which gives us the causal contribution of the harm and benefit uh, that is created by the system. So roughly speaking, uh, we're going to look at the profit lift, which is one of the objectives uh, of, the, of the system. So this is simply the measured profit minus the profit we would expect if we didn't intervene at all. And then we're also going to look at the rejection rate lift. So this is the measured rejection rate minus that which we would estimate if we didn't intervene at all. Uh, we also identified the benefit of acquiring, but note that that's directly proportional to the profit lift, so we don't need to analyze it separately. We can come up with fairness measures by conditioning these lifts on the group defining attributes. So asking not just what the lift was, but what was the lift for foreign national customers and for, um, uh, and for local customers. So here we see the overall trade-off landscape of the main uh, two objectives that we're looking at now, the, the profit and the rejection rate harm increase. We've plotted these in terms of the lift thresholds set separately for foreign and local customers. So that's on the X and Y axes. On the left, we can see that the max profit approach is to select about a threshold of 0.3 for foreigners and 0.2 for locals. This indicates that as the historical um, data indicated, uh, foreigners are a little more likely to be rejected for loans. So we want to have a slightly higher threshold when we select them. On the right, we see that the best way to get low rejection rate um, increases is with high thresholds, which makes sense. Don't market to anyone and we won't cause anyone harm from marketing. So our hypothetical bank has chosen to manipulate the harm benefit trade-offs with these two thresholds. So this is what we're seeing here is the landscape of their possible choices. Now to actually demonstrate the thresholds in our hypothetical bank, the, uh, the ethics governance function quantified our fairness objective, which was not to raise the harm uh, rejection rate too much. They defined too much as being 1% was the limit based on historical data. Here we can see the threshold for foreigners that achieves good profit but less than 1% increase in rejection harms. And in this case, the bank's data scientists selected the threshold somewhat conservatively. This was because there were fewer foreigners in the customer base, so therefore a higher uncertainty around the rate estimates so that we see it's actually a bit lower than 1%. We can do the same thing for local customers. Here setting a threshold of 0.4 that limits the harm increase to 1%. This one is less conservative because we have a greater number of local customers and, and lower uncertainty. In the interest of time, we'll skip the final two parts of the assessment which relate to justifying the use of personal attributes and also examining the systems monitoring and review. Again, refer to the case study document to have an in-depth look at those. Finally, to summarize, the material we went through just now forms the input of the assessment, not the output. That is, it's the answer to the questions in the methodology. But the assessment itself, these answers go to an assessor who judges whether the system does indeed fulfill its objectives and align with the FEAT principles. Depending on the scope of that assessment, the assessor may also critique the system's objectives themselves. All right. Now I'm going to hand back over to Grace to continue with the tutorial. Cool. So maybe we have time for just one quick question. Um, so the question is, Capital One settled for $21 million with uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in the US for potentially steering customers via this sort of uplip um, uh, marketing on their homepage. How and where should this sort of interaction driven happen and what would the feat methodology have flagged the problem? Okay, thanks for that question, Josh. Uh, it's a really good one. So first, presuming, uh, so I, I must admit I don't know the details of that case, but 
presuming that the system provided some kind of disparate harm or benefit from its actions. So I'm imagining it recommended some class of people better products or some similar thing like that. Then it would certainly uh, be in the target of our uh, of our methodology and would likely be uh, would likely be flagged. Of course, it would depend on whether the banks chose to examine those particular harms in their assessment and uh, whether whether that how explicitly that was brought out. If they didn't, then we've tried to design things so that the assessors would still flag it from the description of the system and from the requirement that the banks are explicit about the system's objectives and also, of course, the data and the mechanisms by which they are um, achieving those objectives. In terms of when uh, it should occur, I, that's probably beyond my... Um, qualification i won't make a normative claim about that but uh but it's certainly we believe um a really extensive practice this kind of up um uplift marketing and and of course can have especially when the product is consequential or being rolled out at a huge scale can have really substantial and insidious um negative consequences if it's not designed very carefully Great. If uh, we're this, we'll, we're running a little bit tight on time, so I'll go ahead and just speak to briefly to our, the future research aspects, and then we can continue to answer questions in the chat. So, as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, our goal here was to show so, some of the challenges that we faced in taking theoretical work into the applied context. Here we've identified some areas for further research based on what we think banks might need to conduct uh, better assessments. These are not new areas of research and we recognize that there's ongoing work perhaps even by those of you in attendance in the audience. But our interest is in highlighting where the banks may have those, those real life implementation challenges. For example, a challenge might, they might have is with data availability. They might not have access to ground truth data such as ethnicity, or they might need to infer information such as you know, those who were declined alone but would repay, hence the need for uh, reject inference, or they might need to account for substantial delays in obtaining labels, uh, the sort of defaults occurring later in a loan. Now, these challenges matter because they impact the potential severity of the harms to the customer and to society. So, you know, we're given that this sort of short on time, we'll, we'll, uh, we don't, I don't think, well, we will just, uh, we'll, we'll answer some questions about the research in, in the chat. Um, and if you have any research that you'd like to bring to our attention, we're, we're all ears as well. Um, Veritas, the consortium started with the principles in 2018, and they didn't stop there. In 2020, they explored fairness principles leading to the work that we discussed today. And then throughout the year, the consortium will take on a more ambitious project where they're going to be addressing the remaining principles, the ethics, accountability, transparency principles, all in concurrent projects. So this includes case-specific considerations and software development where appropriate. Different firms were selected for those portions of work, and we look forward to seeing what they produce. Maybe they'll present next year. We believe once complete that this effort will represent a first-of-its-kind comprehensive approach to building responsible AI development and monitoring tools um, and an example for many regulators worldwide. And I've just been informed now that I've moved uh, that we we actually do have until uh, 10 past the hours. So for those of you who'd like to stay, we'll take uh, some more questions and we'll also answer in Slido. But thank you very much for coming and uh, we appreciate your your questions and your time. Yeah, thank you everyone. And, and please, if you come up with any questions after the fact, um, all our email addresses are on the screen now, and please do feel free to fire us an email. We're always happy to 
to have a follow-up discussion and chat further about the work and answer any questions that we can. I'll stop sharing and just uh, have, we'll stay on the line and answer in Slido or, okay. Okay, so we haven't had any additional questions and, and this is our time to finish up. So once again, thank you everyone for attending the tutorial. We're really looking forward to hopefully discussing things further with you and, and interacting during the rest of the great conference program up ahead. So thanks very much.